Hi, today we're looking at batch normalization, accelerating deep network training by reducing internal covariate shift by Sergei Ioff and Christian Skidesk. Yeah, not my, not the best pronouncer. Um, Sejedi. Close enough. All right, so this is a bit of an older paper. And uh, it's I, I think it's still good to look at it. It's relevant and um, people just kind of throw batch normalization into networks and maybe don't really know what it's doing. So let's look at it. Um, so what these people argue is that in a network, usually you have structures like this. So if something like that, um, it means that your your loss kind of this is a two layer network. Your loss is a composition of the first layer on the input to you with parameters theta one, and the second layer uh, with parameters theta two. So conceptually, that would look something like this. You have your input, maybe it's an image, right? Um, and you put it through the network, and it becomes some intermediate representation, right? That's x zero, that's x one and or maybe we'll call it even h h1 hidden representation right then that becomes then through the layer becomes h2 and so on right so these the, the, this stuff here these this would be weight matrices w1 w2 that transform the image into a new image or whatever so what they're arguing is that well if you only consider a single layer like the first layer here. Um, it's kind of the same if you only consider the second layer with the H1 now as the input, right? It, it's pretty natural to see each layer of the neural network is kind of like its own transformation, taking inputs and producing some outputs. So what people usually do with the very first input here with your data, uh, in machine learning generally is so-called whitening the data, which means that they have this over here. Um, usually data is whitened, uh, I can't find it. But what it means is you basically wanna, if you have data, let's say here is a coordinated axis, you have 2D data, and you wanna, you might wanna do a kind of a linear regression on it, and you have data that's kind of like that, right? It it suits you to transform this data into by first of all looking where its mean is, mean is about here, then subtracting that, so here here, and then kind of dividing by its standard deviation in each direction. So there's a standard deviation here and there is a standard deviation here. So you would transform this data into something like, maybe something like this. So you see that the mean, the mean is now in the middle and the it's not so elongated anymore. So you have a much easier time to kind of learn learn something on this data than on this data over here simply because our classifiers usually tend to rely on like inner products and if you if you do an inner product here um, you have one of these vectors here and you do some inner product it's always going to be far away from from the mean and thereby the inner products are going to be large no matter what right whereas here if you take a random one and then another random. So two ran if you take two random points here, their two vectors from the mean are almost the same. Whereas if you take two random points here, they tend to look you know uniformly in, in the directions. So it's kind of the sense we know that machine learning methods work better if we whiten the data first. So these people ask, hey, why why do why do we only do this at the very beginning, right? Why don't we why if each layer is basically takes its input and learns something. Each layer is basically a machine learning method. Why don't we just whiten the data to every single layer or, or 
you know every single sub component of a deep network and that's the, the kind of basic step here so they, they argue how this has been kind of tried before or what kind of methods you would usually get and why these aren't so good um, mainly because you kind of need to intermingle this whitening with training the network and thereby if you just go about this naively then you would not you would not um you would kind of produce artifacts from training so that's that's this section this section here um where they argue that it's not really you can't really go about this super naively but what they do isn't super complicated but they, they just do it in a smart way so we'll jump directly to that um what they say is okay let's look at what they call normalization via mini batch statistics all right let's say we have a some some d-dimensional input x right and we're just going to look at per dimension so we, we only care about per per individual dimension um, normalization all right so what do we get what do we need to do <clears throat> we're going to take the kth dimension we're going to subtract from it the mean of the kth dimension within a mini batch right within a mini batch of data so a mini batch may be something like 32 examples or 100 examples or something like this and then we'll divide by the variance of that mini batch um, so this is this is done over here in in basic so you compute mu b mu of the mini batch which is simply the empirical mean of that of the data at that particular layer <clears throat> and then you compute sigma squared b which is simply the the, the empirical estimate of the variance of that of um, computed on that particular mini batch and then you transform your data by subtracting that and by dividing it by this and this 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 constant here is simply to prevent from dividing to by you know two two small values uh, so you get like in numerical problems um, so what does it do it does basically what we pr what we did above um, but now what they say is okay we want to make sure that this transformation can potentially you know um, represent the identity because sometimes or like a natural natural if you had to do something with your input when giving it to the next layer like the very baseline is to do nothing to it right to do the identity transform um, but if you do if you do this you pr probably won't end up with the identity transform except if the mean is exactly zero and the variance is exactly one right so what they say is okay we'll also introduce two new parameters to this here this this uh, gamma and this beta here and these are learned like other parameters in the network we learn the parameter gamma and beta and gamma and beta are simply gamma is simply a scalar that this transformed x is multiplied by and beta is simply a scalar that is then added to it so in each dimension of your hidden representation you basically learn how to scale it and how to shift it scale and shift after you've done the normalization so first first you do the normalization where is it right first you go from this type of data to this type of data and then you say well but maybe it's actually more beneficial to you know ha have it not centered or whatever so so that the network can actually learn then to transform this somewhere it, it, this might seem this might seem redundant but it's really powerful because um, what you're basically saying is that okay this probably isn't the best you know distribution this probably is better but if the network kind of if the backpropagation algorithm or the training algorithm decides that this first representation was actually useful it has the option of going back 
but it also has the option of going to any other kind of form of distribution. So so it's it's pretty powerful um, in, in terms of what it does. Okay, um, it's not really correct here that it has the power to go to any distribution because it's only kind of a um, per dimension scalar that it learns, but still, um, it the potential to transform the distribution uh, by these learned scalars is is pretty big. All right. <clears throat> so basically, that's it. That's <laughs> that's that's the whole that's the whole shebang. Um, you normalize your inputs to each layer uh, by this formula, and then you introduce new parameters um, that you learn along with your network parameters. Uh, so this kind of has some implications. Um, first of all, one implication is this here. If you build a batch norm into your network, it kind of learns this, this plus beta, which is basically a bias parameter. If you think of a traditional kind of fully connected layer. This isn't a fully connected layer because this scalar here is only per dimension, but the bias in a fully connected layer is also just per dimension. So the, the, the beta is equal to a bias in a fully connected layer. So if you have a batch normalization after or um, after a after a fully connected or convolutional layer or anything that can or sometimes has a bias parameter, it's almost not worth it to kind of learn both. So you would rather just only have the one from the batch normalization and leave and use the convolution or fully connected layer without a bias. So that's kind of one implication. Another implication is we have just lost the kind of the, the ability to have deterministic test time inference. Um, so much like dropout, which is kind of a random dropping out of nodes. Uh, here, we have quantities that depend on the mini batch. So not only the individuals sample, but they actually depend on what other samples are randomly selected to be trained with that particular sample. Um, so that's, that's kind of awkward if you kind of want to have uh, some deterministic reproducible thing at test time. So what people do is, and here, this is discussed, what people do is while training, they use these quantities, the, the, the quantities uh, we just discussed, but they keep kind of a running average over them. So what I, what I would do is in each mini batch, I would compute this mini batch mean and this mini batch variance, and I would keep quantities um, I would keep running averages of them, right? And at test time, I'm going to plug in these running averages. So there's nothing dependent on the mini batch anymore. Uh, that's, so that, that's, that's a pretty neat trick, I think. And, um, you can, you can even imagine like at the end of your network training, simply using these here to kind of fine tune the weights to these exact parameters. Um, so that's one thing that's, that's kind of, uh, you have to pay attention to. So in, usually in neural network libraries, there are, there are parameters you can set whether or not this network is in train mode or in test mode. Um, and depending on that, the batch norm layer will use the mini batch statistics or we'll use the kind of all over data set statistics. All right, the second thing is training. So how do you actually train this thing? Because now you can't, you can't just, right? We, we started with our, with our multi-layer network up here, right? F2, F1, right? First, I'm gonna put my things through F1, and then I'm gonna put my things through F2, right? And the the back propagation here is is quite easy. So well, let me get rid of this. The back prop here is quite easy. You go the L, and maybe you want to derive it by theta one, right? So you first going to 
derive it by the hidden representation one and then the hidden representation one with respect to theta one. So the hidden representation would be whatever comes out of here, or H1, sorry, not I, um, and so on. So you, you kind of chain rule your way through here. But now in between these layers here, you have these batch norm things. And so the, the authors discuss how we now do backpropagation in the face of these things. So here is basically what they discuss. Um, it actually pays to, to to have a graph of what's going on. So here is x. This is the input to our layer, right? So what do we compute from x? We compute mu, let's just call it mu, or mu b it's called here, right? This is the mean of x, of all the x's. So we, this is x, x i until x, well, x1 until xn. This is the mini batch. Um, we compute the mean, and then from this and from this, we can compute this estimate of the variance, right? We need both. Um, all right, so we now have the mean and the variance over the mini batch. So we're going to take one of these x's, just the ith one, right? And we're going to use this and this to compute x, what? Compute x, is it called hat? Yeah, probably, it's called x hat, right? Yeah, we saw above x hat, so x hat is x, uh, x hat i is x i minus mu b divided by sigma squared b the square root of it plus this kind of little constant here. We're going to leave away the little little constant for clarity's sake. Actually, it's in the calculations here. But right. So um, then we have a new parameter, gamma, right? And we're going to use it and our x hat to compute, and also this beta here, to compute y hat. Uh, y or y, just y. And of course, this is i, this is i, right? So, and this here is our final output of the layer. Um, so you can see now the backpropagation paths if you go through here. So the backpropagation path, if we have some loss coming in here, we backprop through yi, right? So here is the l, the loss to yi, that's here, right? So if we want the, for example, the backprop with respect to beta, what we do is we simply, and this is this is over the mini batch, of course, um, we simply backprop here through this path. So in our in our formula for beta, there should be only mention yi, and that's what we see here, right? In our formula for gamma, there should only be mention of yi. So because the path leads only through yi. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Actually, because the of the what I mean is of the derivative with respect to yi. Of course, the we also have to pay in, take into attention that this is multiplied here by this x hat i, where of course that's not the case when we just add something because the derivative um, of two of of an addition like x plus b with respect to b disregards x, whereas if it's x times b, it doesn't disregard, disregard x. All right, um, so if we, yeah, so you can, you can go back. So the interesting bit basically comes when we want to find out, okay, how, because here is, here is an, another layer, right? Down here somewhere, there is another layer. And we basically want to know this input here to the next layer, how do we compute it in the face of this mess here? Um, because we, it, it's, not, it's not so easy, right? So you have to see we have three paths here. We go back through x, and let me get rid of these blue lines. Um, we, go, we go back through 
x hat directly to x. Um, we go one path is through here, and one path is uh, through this this mu. So we basically have to compute derivatives with respect to sigma squared and mu. And for that, we need the derivative with, with respect to x hat. So basically, the way back prop works is you just find all paths from where you are to where you want to go. And then you, you kind of iteratively compute this. So this one here is the, easy, the easiest. As you see here, they did it on top. Um, well, first they did this one, which is simply um, going from y to x hat i, is that. Then they go from x hat i to sigma squared, which simply involves kind of the reverse operations of how you got it. Uh, this is simply a derivative formula here of the, of the division by square root. Um, then you can use this, you can use this quantity here to compute that. So basically you just go in reverse of how you computed the operations in the first place. We said we needed mu b to compute sigma squared b, now we need the derivative with respect to sigma squared b in order to compute the derivative to mu b. Um, and once you have that, and you see the, the addition here, <coughs> the add here is the fact that, oops, is the fact that two things contribute to mu b. So two paths lead to lead to mu b. One path is from from here and one path is through here. All right. So here there should be a green. Um, since two paths you have two components to your derivative and you add each of them. Uh, so that's how that's going to be. And then this here, with respect to this x here, we have three paths, right? Because we have three arrows going out of xi. One here, one here, and one here. So we have to take into account all of them, right? So this one is pretty easy, that's the first one. Then the second one, um, oh, sorry, this. The second one, uh, goes through this mu b, which we've already computed, and the third one goes through the, the sigma, which we've also already computed, right? And these are added um, because all the paths, you have to all add all the paths in the backprop algorithm. Maybe we'll do a, actually a video on backprop uh, later to, to, get, to really dive into how this works. Um, and finally, they, uh, they compute these, these we've already discussed. So in essence, the whole thing is differentiable. Um, you just have to kind of pay attention how, how to do it. Um, but the whole thing is differentiable, and thereby you can basically backprop through a network that has these batch normal layers in, uh, built in. So that's pretty cool. Um, I just want to quickly jump over to the results. Um, and yeah, keep in mind, this paper is from 2015. So networks weren't that big uh, back then. Um, we didn't know that much about training yet, but the interesting thing is they basically discovered, look, we can, we can have drastically fewer steps in order to reach the same accuracies. And these are kind of the activations of the network over the course of training. So without patch norm, you see, especially at the beginning, there's large fluctuations in the activations. And um, because because they use batch norm now, there's no such thing. So basically, the reason for that is, pre is pretty simple, right? While you learn, and you learn your layered representation here, let's say there's x, and x is fed through layers, and there's hidden representations each in between, right? So you're trying to learn all these parameters, let's say this one here, w3, but at the beginning of training, everything is kind of prone to shifting around a lot. So when you change w1, that kind of changes the entire distribution of your hidden representations after the fact. So basically, whatever you learn for w3 is now already almost obsolete, because you've changed w1, basically, and w3 was kind of assuming that its inputs 
um, would would remain the same because that's what you assume in machine learning. Your input distribution is kind of the same. So um, that's why at the beginning of training, you see these kind of large variances. And with batch norm, this tends to go away. So that's pretty cool. Um, they also kind of show, they mainly show that they can reach the same accuracies as other, as other uh, training methods, but with much, much fewer steps, and they can go much higher learning rates than others. So, um, because because of that. So that's pretty cool. Um, I encourage you to, you to check out the rest of the paper. Use batch norm in your network. It sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't work, strangely enough. Um, but, I you know, I guess that's just a, a matter of experimentation. All right, that was it for me. Bye-bye. Uh,